Welcome to the Product Quest podcast. Thank you for coming along on our journey to better understand innovation and product strategy. My name is Jan Vermut, and joining me, as always, are my co hosts, Scott Burleson and Jonathan Edwards. Many of you listeners will know that this podcast has, let's say, a jobs to be done affection, to put it mildly. Um, and in this episode, we will do something very un job to be done like we will talk about a solution. It's a solution that everyone is talking about right now. And of course, it's AI or artificial intelligence. What we want to do today is look at AI from two perspectives. The first one is how AI is or might be useful in the context of jobs to be done philosophy, but also jobs to be done practice. And the second one is more general. What customer jobs might AI help to address? When you think about a company context, what jobs is AI well suited to do? What kind of new products can we think about where AI is a good solution? Today, it's the PQP team only, and we want to jump right in. So let's start off kind of easy and get, get things going uh, more difficult as we go along. Just an open question, Jonathan, Scott, like, have you, have you been using AI? What's your experience so far? Can you tell us just where did your journey with AI start? I guess I'll jump in first. The, um, for me, well, the, well, the first real immersion I had even to really thinking about it was when we had Harvey Castro as a guest on our podcast last year, and he, was, he went over a lot of AI uses in healthcare. And um, I was introduced to concepts such as uh, hallucinations and Harvey had, had a very balanced view on it, I thought, um, in what it can prompt in sort of what the short term you might expect. Um, essentially, the long term potential is almost unlimited, hard to predict. Uh, yeah. But then also in some of the short term, um, what would I say, um, I'm missing a word, um, uh, challenge, challenges with it or uh, precautions in the short term while yeah. it's still ramping up. So that was, and so um, not too long after that, I was working on a, um, a jobs we done project in a surgical space. And for me, um, anytime I'm doing a jobs we done project or research project, you know, I'll, clearly you're interviewing customers, but you know, the, part of that work has always been to also do a lot of secondary research. Um, and for medical projects, there's yeah. a tremendous amount of medical literature available. And so in which in which the, the problems and challenges with any surgery or whatever you're studying, they've been it's in depth and there's this wealth of information available. So that was always my starting point is to I say st starting point, but almost medium point and finishing point, because I would in parallel yeah. to interviewing customers, I would stay immersed in all that in all the these um all the, these medical journals and articles that were published and yeah. so for me as i i found ai and chat gpt very helpful as a sort of a supplement to that work and here's what i what i mean i would yeah. i would you know you start reading an article and there's go, you know you're introduced to a whole new terminology and some yeah. things are assumed and so as i would stop reading and i would i would interview chat gpt to understand the definitions of words and get backgrounds of things and really get up to speed. And then I would go back to the article. And so this was, you know, you might say a time consuming process going back and forth, but it was, it was, I would say I'm learning more per minute or at least as much per minute as interviewing a real customer. So that, that was my first, that was my first, um, as a practitioner, um, yeah. Uh, experience actually using AI. Yeah, yeah, I can really relate. So smartening up, basically, especially I think the medical case is just very comes very much to light. I think it, the problem is there in all the other industries as well, but in the medical context, the definitions of words are so precise. Yes. And you have to just there's a jargon that you need to kind of yes. get yourself into first, otherwise you're you're completely lost. Yeah, Jonathan, how about you? So I've not actually really used AI in any kind of innovation um, context, um, except that I came to it through questioning innovation. And uh, it's been quite a while that I've been actually reading up on this quite a few quite a few years actually, and I've, I've done a whole journey around around these questions. Um, already prior to the LLM and Chat GPT explosion. 
The the way I came to it was basically around um, well trying to understand innovation um, at the core. I mean, it's it's not easy to kind of take a step back and talk about this in a more general manner. But the way I would describe it is at the base, it's all about understanding decision making. Um, and I know that's a very kind of um, well general view. But I, I think it helps to to frame it in that way. And and what I mean by that is <clears throat> that when people decisions are everywhere, and in innovation they're everywhere. There's decisions on the side of uh, customers that uh, decide to use a certain product rather than some other product. Um, there's decisions on the side of uh, designers or innovators uh, who uh, decide what they, how they design their product and what they put in their, their products. So all these questions, what are these, you know, what is, uh, are the criteria and how do people make decisions is one aspect. Uh, which uh, one could call a descriptive view of, of, of things. So trying to understand how people make decisions uh, by looking at humans and how they act. And there's many interesting books on that, such as uh, all the work on, you know, behavioral uh, economics and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, all these, these traditional, this, this whole um, space. <clears throat> but I think there's also a more, um, different approach we can take, which is, I think, uh, much of the um, motivation of also AI researchers, I get the feeling, which is to try and build a system that makes decisions. And in order to understand better what a decision is and how to make decisions. So what one could call maybe a normative uh, kind of approach. So you're not describing how, you know, okay, how are people deciding things, but you're trying to make a system yourself in order uh, maybe in the future to also understand how we make decisions. <clears throat> and that's how I basically got to AI because um, who are the people trying to make systems that make decisions? Well, it's uh, people working in in AI. Yeah. And, and actually, the way I started going about it was really from the perspective of of uh, what's called planning. So how um, AI systems can plan, um, and planning involves obviously having goals and and trying to achieve these goals and figuring out how to achieve these goals. Uh, I guess people will recognize obviously some similarities with uh, a jobs to be done perspective in 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 that kind of frame. Um, and and this is obviously something that's very much um, relevant in robotics. What um, what has come about now is slightly different, and it's it's kind of interesting because it's really it, it's not at all about planning. I mean, these systems, I would argue, are not able to to plan these these LLMs um, systems. They, they because planning requires uh, some understanding of a concept that we also discussed in a previous podcast, which is uh, ca causality, understanding mechanisms of how things work. And um, so basically, that was my my journey into in, into this field. And at the moment, I'm actually also um, studying this. I, I went back back to 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 studying this these topics, um, and. Um, yeah, so that's basically how I got interested in in this in this field. Yeah, I think mean, that's very interesting. From another, so I, there's there's this long tradition of thought in different areas of as well that that basically says if we can build a machine that does the same thing as a human, we will understand the human. And I think a large part of like what AI researchers are trying to do is to build a model such that we understand ourselves better. I don't think. I have the impression that we built something that somehow mimics some parts of what we do, but we understand it less than before. Exactly. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that's a different, mm. different angle. <laughs> okay, so let's let let me bring in a little bit to 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 jobs to be done. I I was recently in um in another um um well how what is it? like a format of a good friend of of this podcast. Let's call him that uh, Jim Kalbach's, like he does these jobs to be done Untangled series. 
And he recently said in that postcard, he put out a, a statement, and I think I would just want to put it to you and see how you react to it. He said, well, can, he said Jobs event was made for the for the age of AI. It was made to be combined with with AI. So do you see like immediately some elements of jobs to be done in general that are kind of particularly prone to be combined with AI or how, how would you, how would you react to this? I think so. I think it makes sense. And I also think, uh, well, and I think if you've been a jobs to be done practitioner, I think you've got a little head start in using AI. Um, oh. Just a very tangible example that comes to mind is uh, with with our company, we have Blueprinter software and software um, to, for practitioners as they conduct interviews to uncover a large list of outcomes and also to prioritize. But we added an AI module in last year, and but the and but the challenge with that with with doing adding a feature like that is it's one thing for me to use it, you know, as, as yeah. essentially I'm in the role of product manager for this software. Um, but it's another thing to have a feature in there that all the users can use. Yeah. I'm, I'm reminded that, or I'm, re, I'm sort of reflect on my John Deere experience, and we would have features that did all kind of cool things, like more decks that would attach themselves. And it's one thing for an engineer to do it behind the fact, like the engineer who designed it to do it behind the factory. It's another thing for people of different ages and terrains and all the variables the real world brings put it out in the wild like it actually use the feature um and so but jobs to be done language and you've also probably most folks have seen like there's this whole little cottage industry of people developing uh (laughs) jobs to be done prompts yeah but we we used we used jobs to be done language i mean more specifically the tony owick's job to be done language of a job executor, the person's executing the job, the job to be done itself, you know, the the problem to be solved, a, jo- a task or objective, and also the concept of just um, context, so you could narrow the yeah. scope, uh, you narrow the scope of it, and we use that exact language and put that into software, and now you don't have to worry about writing prompts. I mean, I don't want to sound like a commercial, but the the but uh, but a user if they can just understand. Uh, what those terms mean, what they, what these jobs be done terms mean, job executor, job and context. If they can understand those three terms, then the the template is there. They fill it in yep. and it will immediately, uh, it will write the props for them. Um, and so again, that's Tony Olick's work. I just copy, use it, uh, you know, as a practitioner for many years now. But so, but I think the thinking is that, you know, well, from that perspective, well, the the part, the type of jobs you've done known as ODI or outcome driven innovation, originally it really was a confluence of Six Sigma, you know, eliminating errors, and um, and market research. It was sort of those two things coming together. Yeah. Well, and I mean, the third leg, of the stool would be Christensen and jobs we've done, but it's about getting very logical in your thinking and very clear in your thinking and using very precise terms. And so, uh, so jobs be done training teaches you that. And with that, now you can, well, it teaches you that why. So for the purpose of, you can have a conversation with a person and you know what information you're, you know how to scope the conversation with the person, you know what information you're looking for and ultimate, and with a little bit of experience, you'll know how to ask questions and probe. But essentially yeah. that same thinking and skill set applies to AI when you're, writing prompts is it's the exact same thing except except whatever ai engine you're interviewing doesn't get tired doesn't get bored doesn't cost very much yeah um so i don't know if that was exactly what jim meant but um yeah. the conclusion rings true to me for for that reason if that makes sense yeah yeah, yeah. I, I so i think it's it's a lot of what you say is is i thought that's the same thing i think I mean, somehow these machines, or I mean, I've been using mostly ChatGPT to be to be very transparent, and and um, I think a lot of okay, let's put it that way. The usefulness of these things comes down uh, often to how well are you able to use language. I mean, it's it's the, yes. the interaction that you have yes. with the thing is language, and and yes. you have to be very like yes. you have to know a lot. 
how do you explain something to somebody who lacks the context? Yes. And that can skew the responses a lot. And I think what Jobs have done really brings to the table, and you mentioned this, is a quite consistent way of speaking. Yes. Like we know what, or okay, more in detail than many other approaches, we know what we mean when we meet, when we say outcome statement, job executor, context. There is a kind of a system already in place that probably is easier yeah. to use for a machine. And I think it has it has advantages in all different kinds of way. But but for me, it was it was that part. I think like you can, we can explain quite in detail what we mean when we say something is an unmet need. Which is very, very different from just just having a fluffy idea of it has to be a pain point or something like an outcome statement that isn't met, blah, blah, blah. So there is quite of a, you know, so, and, and I think a lot of this interaction with, with AI and jobs to be done is, is centers around this question of how able are you kind of, you, uh, how able are you to use words consistently? And I think yes. that, that is really one of the powerful aspects of jobs to be done. A hundred percent agree. The, um, you make me, think of a few things. One is if you've ever taught these skills, taught jobs you've done skills to people interviewing, you'll notice that in short order, some people will shock you with how great, how quickly they grasp it and run yep. with it. And others will shock you with how they are never, ever <laughs> going to be able to be close to being a practitioner. And with some, and as a trainer, you sort of, you sort of, you take responsibility for <laughs> that. The, the, you know, you sort of take, especially the the ones that are struggle. It's like, well, wow, what what can I do to be better? How can I teach this better? How can I keep people interested? The con right or wrong, the conclusion I've come to, Jan, is what you said. It's it's their Eng it's their language skills, it's their writing skills, which is not something it's reasonable to teach somebody in a a couple of day workshop and the people that have excellent communication skills and writing skills and language skills, they grasp it and run with it. And they, because a job to be done is written in words, the outcomes yeah. beneath it are written in words. And so um, right or wrong, that has been my conclusion is that what's the difference in the people that do so well, the people that just, they just need to do something else for a living is this, ability for language and so that's a it's all i'm really glad you brought it up because it, um it's, it's something that might might not have come up otherwise and i think that is so important because when you're querying which whatever engine um ai engine yeah. you're using language i don't know how else you would do it i mean it's not gonna <laughs> it's not gonna you can't like show it you you're angry yes, and kind of plug happened, it in directly right <laughs> it's language so your ability to, to express things with precision in words you know, so I that so that should, you know, so we noticed that we were sensitive to that with jobs be done type stuff, but you know that ability to communicate in language is probably going to, at least for the short term, is going to separate people who are able to fully use AI and who are not. Yes. Now, having said that, you know, may AI will get smart enough to where you can be poor at language and still I don't know, but certainly it seems like for some. Trend, transitory period of time, those with better language skills will have would have an AI advantage over those who don't. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree, and I, th I think it's it's this um, it's this weird ability that you need to develop of of realizing what are you implying, like what are yeah. all the things that you are kind of implicitly assuming that you need to make explicit so that yeah. so that the machine or something like that can, can can really understand you precisely and i think that is that's not so obvious that's that's a very hard thing to do yeah that's um, a good observation but uh but yeah i think it reflects on 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 i think it also reflects on how well honestly kind of the theory has been formulated i think if you if you're an a the results that I've, I mean, I've played around with ChatGPT and kind of create me a list of outcomes and like who hasn't. Uh, so, and, and the results are, are are surprisingly good. And I think if yeah. if you reach a place where you can explain your concept in a way that a machine understands it, understands it, your your definition is quite good. Like, so I think if yes. you're able to teach it to a machine to follow a certain structure, that for me is a is a sign of okay there is that's contextual clarity right so, right or conceptual clarity sorry right so one of the latest features that 
was included in chat gpt is this uh, the possibility of creating gpts so these kind yeah. of um personalized chatbots so you could do a an einstein gpt or well whoever whichever person who who's written has a lot of uh, of written text you can you can create a gpt around around this and and i think as as you mentioned as uh, jobs to be done has very well defined concepts um there's probably something that can be done here in terms of creating some kind of gpt or something where the the system would be able to use these well defined concepts in a constructive way um i i have a somewhat uh, different perspective on the general idea if we try to place this into the context of innovation so we're trying to to well innovate you know build something new yeah. and useful um i i also myself of course played around with chat gpt and actually just before this talk i i just tried you know some random questions on chat gpt around give me some ideas for businesses that don't exist yet but that are great opportunities or um you know uh, give me I ideas for underserved markets or uh, which markets have un underserved um uh, needs or, and it I, I agree i mean give some great stuff and and i have a list of all sorts of product ideas that i written down throughout the years you know some like stuff i was like oh, that's a cool idea actually often when i read through them again i think that they're actually not that good but anyway <laughs> i it's i just write anything that goes through my mind i just write it down and I was like, wow, I mean, the ideas, these ideas are, are really great. I mean, I, I can I can give you a, a few. So, for example, there was one I thought was was quite fun, um, uh, which was... Uh, but, but these are now from ChatGPT. That's from not Chat your GPT. list. That's not your no, list. no, it's not mine. Not mine. So from ChatGPT, like a, a smart, smart plant companion, you know, something that would would um, help uh, help like a whole ecosystem around uh, around managing your plants in your home I was like, oh, okay well that's yeah. really interesting you know it's quite yeah. creative and all this um obviously we know that this system uses existing material to produce these so probably this I would imagine maybe exists somewhere on the internet but my um my like kind of question here is, Okay, would it be interesting to use this chat GPT basically as in the opposite way, in the sense that you would use it to see if your ideas are actually really interesting and original? Yeah. It could be that actually you think you have a really great idea. And and I tell you, I mean, anyone I invite anyone to try and ask chat GPT for some business ideas, there's some interesting stuff for it that it, it suggests. But yeah. if it's out there, maybe means that it's, is it really that interesting? I mean, isn't it stuff that everyone's thinking about if if ChatGPT is able to talk about it? So it, would it be maybe a way to kind of discriminate between what is really a, an interesting business idea versus not? Yeah. I mean, imagine if you had like an evaluation machine, that would be really nice. But I think there we have to just, I have no clue. Probably, I mean, it will give you an answer, right? I mean, you can ask it anything. It will give you an answer. How good, how it will sound sophisticated if you want it to sound sophisticated, <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. So, but, but yeah, I, I, so I think there is this, we all made a similar experience. I think it's, a, um, it's surprisingly good, but, but some stuff is still lacking. I think in general, or it's not, it's not, there is a lot of potential, but where does it really go? I, I so in this, in this, more jobs to be done since Scott, you mentioned that you included it in, 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 in your software. And like, could you maybe describe a little bit, I mean, a jobs to be done project, depending on how you run it, but has, has, has different steps and different elements to it. So where, where did you then in the end actually include AI and what, what does it help get done? Like where, where in the process yeah. is it helpful? Great question. So where it is right now, um, it's in the quality, it's, it's, it's a supplemental tool in the qualitative engineer in the qualitative interviewing portion. And so just as you would interview a customer, um, I mean, if you, you know, took, you know, um, you know um, college students, 
job executor, planning a vacation or, or honeymooners. Uh, we were planning a vacation, whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, our families planning a vacation. And so, and so w within our template there's, you put in the job executor. So maybe that's families. And then, um, then with the contextual clarifier, you could say without children, with young children, with, with adult children, whatever. So you can add, you can add whatever contextual clarifiers you want and as many as you want. And then you, you know, you have the job to be done of planning a vacation uh, then we have we set the um, you set a precision, which is essentially the number of outcomes it'll give you. Uh, if that number's okay. smaller, you would say you know let's say you can put it at five. That's pretty small. It's going to give you five very high level problems with planning a vacation for families. Okay. If you put in a very high number, like forty or fifty, you're going to get much you know much more detail. Now it'll what it does is so it so essentially it lets you interview the AI as if it was a customer to provide, because when you were to interview a real customer, I should say, you know, that's your goal. Like you have this topic of the conversation, planning vacation, you make sure you get the right job executors to interview families with children, without children, whatever you're in your study. And then, um, and then you interview them essentially variations of what challenges do you have when planning a vacation? And you get this long list of needs. So it works exactly the same way, except it takes uh, about seven seconds instead of, uh, you know, many hours. <laughs> by, the, by the time you plan yeah. in recruiting, it's, you know, multiple hours yeah. and whatnot. And so within, say, seven to ten seconds, it essentially completes the interview for you. Now, now they all come up like the the, the user will get a list and um, they don't go into their their queue of of needs until they manually accept them. They have to read every one and manually say, okay. "This is ex accept this, accept this." And honestly, so you want the user to select, just to give a kind of a feedback the, or the practitioner, yes or no. whoever is the practitioner, the, the, yeah. the interviewer, if you will, has to manually do it. And that's you know that's back from our conversation with uh, Dr. Harvey Castro, who's implanted in my mind the thought of these hallucinations. So. Uh, so they have to look at them and decide if that's in or out, you know, if you wanted to be, and this feel, this felt, or this seemed like a very low um, risk way to ease into this because we're yeah. not talking about prioritization. We're not talking about segmentation. We're only talking about the phase of, of, um, of research, the qualitative phase for which your goal is to obtain a complete list of customer needs for which failure is to miss one. So yeah. The worst thing, the worst thing that can happen is you include something that shouldn't be in there, and that's that's that causes you n very small problems. Um, the only, the biggest problem it would create is it would could make your survey longer. So, isn't the risk that you would sorry, not include that you oh, would sorry, not include <laughs> something that should be in there? I'm sorry, say that again. Wouldn't the, the the bigger risk be that you don't include something yeah. that you should include? Yeah, great that question. Which, something. Great question. Yeah. Which is why I would not use it alone. I would use it as a supplement to your real customers, uh, your actual customers. Um, so it's this essentially because anytime you interview any one customer, it's everything about it is going to be incomplete and imperfect. They're going to yeah. give you depth on something they're missing, yeah. you know, or whatever. And that's the reason why you you have a high, decent sample size of folks to cover everything. Well, certainly, if you hold AI interviews up to that same standard of what a real interview would be, it's going to outperform the real interview. Not I don't even I'm not even talking about the efficiency and speed. I'm talking about you're going to learn more. It's clearly faster, but I'm saying you're going to learn more from yeah. that than you would from an individual. So it's no worse. So it's it's there's. Almost as long as you include it, as you would think of it that way, this is another customer. It only it only speeds you up. Now yeah. we're very as we're doing this, you know, we've been very quick to continually point out the limitations. You know, be careful. Yeah. Very similar to what you said, Jonathan. You know, uh, we got to make sure to interview lots of other customers in you know in this, and it could have hallucinations. So that's that's the official word. That's what we should say. But however, practically speaking, when you read through the results, they're really good. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I um 
I feel like that's still the conservative take to say for now that you still need to interview real people. I, I'm not going to say I'm, you, you do need to interview real people, but I have to also say the quality of what it's producing. I mean, it's like, will that always either one? So there's two extremes. One extreme would be, well, one extreme is sort of where we are now being very conservative. This is just another customer. Man, there's zero risk to that. That's that. That's about as conservative as you get because yeah. you're still interviewing. The other extreme would be to say you don't interview anybody, only AI. So those are two. Uh, so we're already at one extreme. We we're beginning with the conservative extreme. So, yeah. but I'm I'm framing these as extremes because there's probably a middle ground in which you can yeah. you can legitimately say you know what, because of the quality of information we learn from AI. You know, let's just say it for one interview program, we plan to interview 15 people. So the conservative approach says that replaces one. But but honestly, I yeah. mean, my 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 opinion, here's my unqualified opinion that is, is unhampered by research or, or any depth <laughs> of knowledge, any sort, just to call it intuition, is that it can replace more than one. And yeah. so if we if you said it replaced five, then well, the value is amazing. The value oh, right. is amazing. And, yeah. and what that but that would change your sample plan. A sample plan in yeah. qualitative research is simply it's the mix of customers you're going to interview to ensure you you get you get everything. And so I I'm literally just thinking out loud here, but I think yeah. to get that middle place, so I'm 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 saying it's more than just inter replaces one. I'm saying it's less than it replaces everybody. Yeah. I think what that would make me do is I would interview, I would use an AI interview and say this. Now, again, I'm just, I'm thinking out loud. I'm not promoting this, but I would say what we learn from, from this AI, it's probably 80 to 90% of all the needs there. And so for my remaining sample plan, I'm going to look for the weirdest cases possible. I'm going to look yeah. for so if I, if I framed it yeah. as families, you know, whatever, I mean, I'm going to look at them at the most, I don't know what, maybe the most geographic distances, the most, you know, the richest, the poorest. I'm going to really push for that remain. If I say this, if I'm, my total sample is 10, let's say I say this counts for seven of them. So not quite half. With that remaining eight, I'm going to look for the weirdest possible yeah. outliers but because I'm looking now, I'm not looking for 80%. I'm looking for that final 10 to 15 weird percent. Now I'm not, at, so right now I'm still as a practitioner, yeah. I'm staying with that more conservative approach. But as I see the quality of information, yeah. I feel like this middle ground is probably in my future. But I don't know. What do, what do you guys think? Does that make sense? It's, first it's, it makes com total sense. Yeah. yeah. Total no, sense I agree. Too. I think the, Kind of the more the, the most extreme will be Jonathan's idea. Like say, let's do away with jobs to be done as a whole and just ask the thing. Like so just ask the machine, is it a good idea or not? And they will tell you, but but probably that's even further. But that would be an ideal case, right? So if you just had a machine that but but so the way we've been approaching it is maybe like almost a step more conservative. I mean, we've been playing around with it. What we what we've doing, what we're doing is and what we've done up to date manually is what we, we call this harvesting. Uh, you can debate if that's a great name, but that's what we call it. Um, and what it basically means is, well, if a client approaches us, give us the research that you already have, or that you have found useful, yes. and we'll use right. the research that you have right. that you can also use. Sometimes yep. it's limited because of all the yep. laws and blah, blah, blah. But some of that you can reuse. And then we say, and you can extract jobs or, or outcomes uh, from that already existing research. Now a machine can do this. Yep. So the, we, we've, we're we tweaking a GPT, as you say. Of course, you have to be super careful about how you share the data and all of that. Um, but but it can be done. It knows, it understands the concept. It can extract them from existing document yep. or at least hint you and say, hey, in this 100-page PDF document, yeah. look at these 10 slides. There, yes. So, And that's already something. That, so you know there is kind of a link to reality there if the research has been done that well which I will assume there is a link to reality. And then the next step will be replacing, gradually replacing interviews. We've also been trying to think about, can we do, can we do four interviews and then let AI expand 
kind of yeah. this. But I think that could probably introduce too much of a skew. So so we kind of dropped this idea. Now we're thinking in the, the same way. So we're testing it right now. We're, 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 before we ran um, jobs with an interviews in a very specific healthcare case, um, which I had no clue about prior. Um, we we let, created just a list just using ChatGPT. Now we're running interviews, and at the end we'll compare. So the results are not yet there, but it's it's um, the first list is scaringly good. Um, yeah. So I created the list. Someone else in our company is now doing the comparison, so that I don't introduce too much bias. Um, and, and and we will see. But it's I had the same experience as you had, Scott. I think like. Two things. So on the one hand, the out- the outcomes they create is really good. You can follow the system. It it they they look like things I've seen before in other industries, and it's ten times better than any junior after trying to do it for three, four, five, six months. So sure. so there's a lot of value in that already, I think. But we'll see. Yeah, for sure. This harvesting it's similar. I mean. You know, it's funny. There's a lot of people like market. So I, I do the same thing. The but there's a lot of you know market researchers that believe that you know as you do that first, they don't want to be exposed to anything because they think it's like biasing what they learn. But I've never, I've never believed that. I've never. There was the original article that gave us the name "Voice of the Customers" 1993, a 30 year old article now, and um, called "Voice of the Customer," um, and they had a graph that probably a lot of folks have seen that showed the number of interviews you need to do before you they get are. to a hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. We're drawing this yeah, asymmetric, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, asymptotic curve Yeah, uh, where, where the more like the first couple, like the first interview, you might uncover 40% of all the needs and the next one, another 10%. And essentially each one has marginally uh, less. Yeah. And so what I have always said is you don't get any extra points for starting at zero. In fact, it's stupid to start <laughs> at zero. There's so many resources yeah. at your fingertips. And, yeah. um, you know, I mean, the w- one that I used at John Deere was a, it was a customer site uh, called Tractor by Net in, in which other tractor owners had conversations with each other and they complained yeah. and this. And I milked that for all sorts of information. Uh, yeah. Also at John Deere, we had something that was called a loyalty study, uh, essentially, but it was... Um, essentially it was after you use a tractor a while you give feedback and you give your, and so I had, I had tens of thousands of customer comments. I could have really used AI back then because I read them all <laughs> individually and coded them. Yeah. But anyway, but, but um, I, I didn't see any advantage. This was, my, this was my t- sort of phrase. It's like, there's no advantage of starting at zero. Like, why do you think? So I just, so maybe there's, it put some bias in your head. But that bias is put there by customers in real world situations. You can it's make that bias, same yeah. argument as soon as you interview somebody. Well, now you're biased because you just yeah. no. as an interviewer, as a professional, look, it's your job to set things aside. It's your job to be able to, uh, you know, to first of all, acknowledge that you're biased regardless, and but to um, be able to set that aside and learn everything you can from every individual so I have never accepted that premise that you should not do secondary research because it biases you. I was like, fine, you start at zero. I'll start, I'll do my secondary research. I'll start at 60%. And well, there's, but, but there's sure. benefits beyond that too, because when you go to interview real customers it, with all the secondary work, you've got this background, you've got understanding when they, they might say something in passing. And if you haven't done your secondary research, you don't, yep. you literally don't hear it. But you're you're sort of in tune to these things, and so that you know to go deeper and and deeper. So I always felt like not only did I get a head start on gathering needs, I was a much because there's every industry, every customer sec has there's a there's a terminology and a language. Yes, the better I can learn that. And we talking about medical, especially especially yes. medical. And what's beautiful about medical is it's very consistent all over the world. I mean, they'll, sometimes there'll be some uh, cultural idiosyncrasies. But, the, you know, for the ma- most part, they use amazingly similar language everywhere in the world. So medical projects are a dream. Yes. But anyways, so um, so you use that same approach, John. And the, the best practitioners I know also, also have gathered secondary research, which was why for me, AI was an easy thing to slip into because it was just another solution 
for what again i used i went through ten thousand statements at deer I, ai would have been very helpful <laughs> for that. yeah yeah i think so 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 it's it's um maybe i want to ask a little bit of a different case i think a lot of a lot of this effort um that they're also seeing different people trying to do with AI in the jobs we done space is centered around the qualitative part. It's centered around the interview. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. My hypothesis right. is, but but is is because as a practitioner, you know, that's that's really hard. I mean, it's work intense. It's time intense. Yes. It's the whole the whole scheduling stuff. It's all. I mean, I I love doing qualitative injuries. No questions about. I mean, it's you wouldn't believe like how much you learn about the person when you talk to them about any jobs to be done way. But so I really enjoy them, but from a, from a, from a, like, if you want to say business model project management perspective, that's the nightmare, right? So that's the, that's where a lot of work is. And I think that's why we all kind of, uh, we gravitate to trying to find a way around this. How can we reduce the pain of yeah. doing, doing qualitative injuries? Now there's sometimes other cases or other industries where, the qualitative is easy in brackets, right? So in, in uh, let me qualify this a little bit. It's easy in the sense that you can get to people, you can talk to them. Um, for example, we did a project on like in, in, in real estate and there's a couple of really big funds in Switzerland yeah. that invest all across. And so, and you know them and they have good contacts. You can reach them. They will give you half an hour, maybe even an hour if they're nice. And you can, so, but there is like in total, there is 16 there, there's, there aren't more. So that's more or less the market. Or, or maybe there is, there's, I don't know, there's 20 and you can you can reach five or something like that. So the 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 harder part is evaluating is that a, is that a market need? Is that a problem in the in the more broader market? I can reach 10, 15, no problem, but I have no means. Or the quant would let's think about medical. If you have really specialized specialized surgeons, there might be a handful, maybe there is. Let's say on the whole world, there's 500, but try to reach those 500 doing a quant for you. You can, but it's yeah. going to cost you a ton of money. So, so the, the qualitative is doable, but it's the quant where it breaks down. So it's the quantity, the validation in the quantitative sense where it's really hard. And I've, I've been trying to find ways of, of using AI for this part, but I, I, it's, it's, it's super hard. I don't know. Have you ever... So, so, I was wondering if our conversation would go there because I think <laughs> the, the qualitative, it's a low risk thing, even in what I described yeah. as, you know, you use it for half your interviews. To me, you're st still sort of low risk. The question is, does AI have the potential to prioritize this list for you? Yes. I don't have the answer to that, but what I, my sense is that at this point in AI's, growth that it's we are unable to put limits on what it will be able to do yes so the practitioner in me is skeptical a little bit but the you know but at the same time you know i think it is fully possible now i think as practitioners that's the part we should sort of be slowest to adopt you yeah. know i think yes. right yeah yeah but um i I had, if I had to guess, I would say it will probably be able to do that, but um, it may be very soon. Um, and Who I don't knows? know what that means for a jobs be done practitioner. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> might mean you're well, not hope as that needed doesn't anymore. happen. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we need to think about the business model, but that's but that's. I mean, we do that all the time. So. Yeah, we we'll have to do something else. We we'll have to. I don't know. <laughs> But I think there is one one part or one element that I also want to want to want to bring in into the discussion. I think there is a danger um, in the jobs to be done space that I have seen to fall too much in love with jobs to be done itself. I mean, you Scott, you say this all the time. It's a, jobs to be done is it's a solution. Yeah. So, and I'm 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 really wondering. So, is the I mean, is it really is the job of a jobs to be done project really to create and quantify outcomes? Is that what we want to achieve? So, so let me maybe expand a little bit. Of course, yeah, we want to do this, and that's interesting, and all sorts of things. But, but, but the most successful projects I've I've experienced are those where a change in the organization happens. So it's 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 not I that bring here's a list, and now the thing is done. But it's it's 
if the team adopts it, yeah. if the organization adopts it, if the people start going about innovation the next time when we're not there differently than if we would have. So you see, so for me, this is the there is a kind of a broader job that I want to achieve as 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 a consultant is is yes, I bring you insights that are concrete and quantified. Like I don't know any other approach that does this, but there is more to it. I want to achieve more than that. You know, I want to I want yeah. to, so and so I'm a little bit skeptical, even if if yes, we can automate this stuff, but don't we then kind of take a huge important part away, which is which is the change in people, the change in how they think and how they go about innovation and how they approach talk to users. So, so, so I'm, yeah, we can automate all we want, but, but in the end, I want to change mindsets or I, I don't know how to put it. I don't know how you, yeah, how you see it. Well, maybe the jobs you don't practice for the future is, uh, well, there's part, the thing that's never worked very well is you can deliver a company this, beautiful list of prioritized outcomes and they still they don't know they don't understand they they can't act on them they they just yeah i there's the project i did um once and it was i, I can't say too much about it but it it very clearly identified a need and um and the company but it was a little bit it was slightly different it was not it, it did not require a super technical solution but it was slightly different than you had the you know, the business director for this business and this one and this one and this one. And the the solution needed to be something sort of between them. It didn't oh. fall in anybody's bucket. <laughs> and, and so they were nobody was interested. Nobody was interested in doing anything with it. And so I go up a little high. I was the CEO. And I was like, I was like, if you guys don't act on this, you're gonna get an email from me someday where somebody else solved it. And Told it, you so. <laughs> it took it took about it took about three years and somebody else solved it. Did I send that email? Yes, I did with the article. Look, they got these guys solved that problem that you guys were interested in solving. I had to say it nicer than that, but but yeah. that's what you remind me of, Jan. I mean, it's and that's been a persistent problem. And so, when they, because for one thing, if there's something that's that's a a need in the market that's not met, it's not met for a reason. Either either there's something difficult about it. Or I don't know. I mean, there's also things like why did it take so long to put wheels on luggage? You know, just just like yeah, it, it did not require some great technical uh, you know breakthrough. But um, but but I mean, who knows? But um, the most successful project I personally worked on as a product manager was sort of weird because there were there were we were taking a product that was built off seas and we were bringing it to be built here be built in the US uh, and there were two there were two factories each both of which were sort of responsible for it but neither with but but there was this gap in leadership and so me as product manager our project manager and we had a technical lead that was just brilliant and we had a massive engineering force of like 40 engineers and so we took advantage of um sort of the confusion leadership confusion and we just yeah. started making decisions in which we could have been fired for. Um, but in other words, we we're making decisions beyond what our, our really our, our power yeah. should have been. And so, but that's a, that's a lot to ask of somebody to do, um, yeah. to, to act, you know, to sort of just start making all these decisions. And so that's not, it's not a repeatable process. It's not yes. something you can stamp out. Hey, have your product managers and your and your engineers just let them have them make just just tell them to ignore their leadership and start so it's not it's so well we did we had a great success but it's not repeatable and so yeah maybe the so it's i think you're you're dead on target to bring that to light well christensen said when something becomes good enough something else becomes not good enough and already today we know if we deliver perfect a perfect you know jobs be done project Companies struggle to act on it for all kinds. That could be a great episode, by the way, all by yeah. itself. And so, if AI can really automate the front part, it doesn't solve the, doesn't solve that back end. If I if I'm understand, I might have gone off on a tangent. Was that sort of what no. you're referring to? No, it's it's exactly what I, it's yeah. exactly what I'm referring to. It's like it's like it's 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 we can get that process perfect. So. Okay, so one anecdote, which which is a different story, but it, it points to the same problem. You can deliver a perfect 
perfect project. I well, okay, of course, I always deliver perfect projects. Of course, blah, blah, blah. but yes. <laughs> that's a different. No, so, Given, but it, you can do it. You can do. You can give it your best, right? So and then and then you you deliver the results, and then the person who is really driving the whole project and 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 then also in charge of bringing it into the organization, just has family changes, personal stuff, right. and they leave the company. Now, uh, what happens? So there is. What can you do now? Now, of course, this is still frustrating, but but sometimes the efforts uh, that you put there. They they just end up in a drawer somewhere because of stuff right. you cannot control, and right. and 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 so that can happen. And it's just so so that's where kind of we spend a lot of effort thinking about how can we how can we help companies translate, let's say these 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 um, insights into either organizational change or how they're set up or how they're then going about in the projects using the results because it's. It, somehow it's not it, the job isn't done when they see the list this it's it's, it's it takes more and, and 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 that's what i'm thinking about so so but but i have no clue if so we we played around with ideas but i don't know if this will really help but i think one one of the the, the barriers of that change or of that impact in the organization is exactly what makes it powerful namely the data driven part data can be super scary uh, yeah. super complex. It's very hard to, it's one thing to read a quote and relate to a person. Now that that's something we do all the, t most of us do all the time, <laughs> but, but dealing with data is kind of the other half of your, your brain, the other, the other part. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's not that easy to do. Right. So we try to think about, for example, can we build something that makes just, so you get the results, you have a, you have a study and then you make it exact ex uh, accessible through AI in the sense that you, I can talk to the results, which is a different thing than having to read a slide or listening to a result presentation. Yeah. Or, or So so maybe there's other ways of, we call this spin, so the, the spin part where we spin yeah. the results. Okay. So how can AI help there is, is, is what I'm trying to, but it's super difficult. And then also I have to admit I'm out of my, out of that's super out of my league. I, I can play around with the idea, test it here and there in very small parts, but then, but then it's it's just it's too complex. So, but yeah, I would love to see more energy spent on that problem. I've always been, that's one of the things that when I first learned about Vimbridge and I learned about we had talked with Biot and yourself and learned about your process. You know, you have this whole spin to growth on the back end where you you stay mm -hmm. with you stay with the clients and help them to take those next steps. I remember, wow, that's something that I, we don't. You know, it's not often done. And I think, wow, what a great service. And I hope your clients take advantage of that. They should. I 100 <laughs> percent they should because because what's the big it's it's quite frustrating as a practice as a jobs you done practitioner when you see it get all this front end work and then you watch and um then companies are there yeah. there's sort of confusion. We could it really would be a good show with all the everything that happens after that, but you know, they struggle to act on it and maybe they've already spent their budget and they don't want to spend more, but that's the, that's that no, they should not stop there. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. got to, if you don't have anything actionable. What have you, what, what yeah. if we don't have anything? Yeah. So I've, I've loved, I really appreciate that about your, your process at Vimbridge, Vimbridge that that's been the growth. Well, thanks. I think it's, it's, I mean, it's also, if you, if you do it, if you apply it within a company, right? So if you're kind of within a, project manager or whatever within a company and you're trying to apply this that that's where your work starts so it's this that's there's right. kind of a missing link yeah. you know it's somewhere in there so um anyway so we so, jonathan there is a lot well, of there is, yeah i mean i, I think it's, i can see the thought forming <laughs> i'm i'm trying to think about some you know how to to make this these thoughts more concrete but the we're getting into some uh, murky waters here i think and yes. um, hard questions so yeah. um i also really appreciate that you brought this um this topic up it's really um it's it's a very interesting point this idea of okay in the terms of the project you know what are we trying to achieve yeah. um uh, so i mean when these let's say machine learning um, uh, uh, systems are, are being trained, there's, there's a distinction between the, the parameters of the, the models or the, the weights, so um, which are what basically 
I mean, you can you can download weights of different models, and and it's basically what allows the system to um, transform an input to to an output. Um, so the weights in ChatGPT will, um, uh, you know, define or there's some amount of randomness and and stuff. But will will when you type in this, it'll output this, and 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 the the ability of these systems to output something meaningful for that you need to train these weights but in the training process mm-hmm. there's there's another set of of parameters and people call them hyper parameters you know and hyper parameters are things that are basically not things that you can automate in the tra- i mean uh, there's different levels of course all of this is is um, kind of you know making shortcuts and stuff but essentially the the Hyperparameters are things that you, as the person creating these systems, need needs to to train. And the whole question of being having a system that can maybe train all its even its hyperparameters and doesn't need some kind of external input to mold it. Well, there you get into you know basically okay AGI you know artificial general intelligence where something can define its own goals can define uh, what it has to be used for and 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 can adapt to a changing environment and so what we're talking about here so this idea I, I think it's a really interesting idea this concept of being able to interrogate the data and I I, I mean that would be brilliant and uh, that you could get some also also a whole kind of uh, um, very analytical uh, uh, result and you could interrogate this Um, I think it's it's an interesting idea I I wonder if this is actually possible that's why I was kind of uh, thinking about this Um, it's it seems to me there you need something that goes really beyond what what we have I could be Can wrong. You expand a little bit. I, I think this is super. So, okay, now we're really opening up. To, after an hour of talking, we're opening up the complexities of the. But 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 okay. So can you just so that I understand this? I I have in a technical sense, I have to admit, I have no clue about this stuff. So I heard I read somewhere that there's a couple of billion parameters, but that it could have been noise. It would have been the same information to me. To be very honest, I have very limited. So are you the the what you've been describing is. The way these things are trained such that they give something like meaningful output, if I understand you correctly. Yeah. And and what I've been thinking about depends on a specific set of these parameters that that are up to this date, some or a part of this is still human, humanly introduced. So it's a human that, that puts yes. them. Is that more or less what exactly? There's a there's there's a lot of design decisions. Okay. that are designed by humans you know so well just the shape of the 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 neural network you want to use the um the the, the way you want to do the training you can you can you can um tw- you know tweak some parameters as to how you want to do the training i mean there's there's all sorts of things that are done by humans as they are training so you're constantly Basically, having human input to sh- to shape these uh, these systems, yeah. um, which we as humans, or let's say living beings, um, intelligent beings, um, we obviously are shaped by our environment. But it, it's it's not that we're shaped by someone who is kind of trying to make us get a certain shape you know we, we just we we do evolve and we do change and and but but there's there's no one well there are lots of people parents want to influence us, parents no <laughs> usually or care well, face, except for facebook obviously that's trying oh, okay, to, that's to influence us. but uh <laughs> no i mean um but so this the idea that you could actually do the somehow the interpretation of the of of the data i i don't know it's an interesting that goes beyond my knowledge too but i have the feeling this is going really somehow maybe beyond uh what these things can do because you're you have to define any time you have to define the goal yeah i i think there we get into a space that goes beyond what these systems can do you know but I don't know, to be honest. That's a shame. 
<laughs> but hey, who knows about who knows about what the future may hold? But I feel we kind of, which is the sign of a good discussion. We kind of piled up our debt of follow up conversations that we need to have. I I I know we promised in the beginning that there will be a second part to this discussion, but I have the feeling that we have to reserve this for another time. How do you how do you guys see this? Agree. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, perfect. So um, there is a promise that we'll do a kind of what can go wrong when kind of applying the results thing. I think we need to get more into this AI part and how companies should go about creating something like an AI strategy. I think Jobs Done has a lot to say about this as well. Um, so that's something to do for 2024. Yeah. All right. Great. I think that concludes today's beautiful Product Quest podcast episode. Please follow us on our LinkedIn page. Reach out to us anytime at productquestpodcast at gmail.com and see you next time.